The New Testament passage for today and also our passage for exegete is found in 1 John chapter 4. We pick up in verse 13 and go through verse 21. 1 John chapter 4 verses 13 through 21. The title for today's passage is Assurance by God's Spirit. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we ask that you enable us to worship in spirit and truth as you have commanded us to do. Only you are able to promote such things in us, Father. We do not conjure such things from our flesh, but they are granted through the Spirit. Our cup is empty. Please fill it till it overflows. In the name of, for the sake of Jesus Christ, be with us now. Amen. Working our way through 1 John has been fun. Again, this theme that we've all been hearing over and over and over is the major theme in all of John's writings, which is love one another. You know, show grace by your love. Show God's love to you uh, by other people showing you love. I mean, love seems to come up and up and up continuously in John's writings. And I love it because other writings in Scripture, that's not their primary focus. There's other things. God was justice. God is mercy. There's all sorts of things. And when we go to the Bible as a whole and read it as a whole, we'll get the whole of God. If we just stuck in one area, we'd only get one piece. And that's why this is the complete and holy canon. All 66 books, as uh, Rob was saying earlier, the Old Testament still matters. In fact, I don't even like calling it the Old Testament. I call this the Testament. And it just, because you can't divorce the New Testament from the Old Testament. So anyway, I don't want to go on a tangent there. As you know, I'm prone to do. So, but... Looking here at the first part, uh, the first 12 verses, let me just quickly read those because they roll right into verse 13 as being part two. He says in verse seven, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, obviously, he's speaking of that special, unique love, the love that goes beyond uh, infatuation, the love that goes beyond appreciation. It's a love that is supernatural. It's uncommon. It's loving the unlovable when they're really acting unlovable. That comes from God. Okay, so that's the love he's talking about. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. If you do not exhibit that love towards people when it is presented to you, I'm not saying that you win every time. In fact, often we lose 90% of those fights with one another and are reminded of God's love in the last 10%. And that's where we grow. Often our, our knee-jerk reaction to people that are rude or obnoxious to us or acting wicked towards us is to strike back. That's our initial reaction. Only something in us gets us to start that and stop and pull it back. And only the spirit in you can give you the power to do that for the right reason, for the right motive. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. So God showed his mighty love for us by giving us his only begotten son. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And remember, propitiation was taking that, that wrath that was being poured out on us who are objecting to God's command over our lives, who are rejecting his words in our life. That wrath was coming for us. Jesus not only takes that wrath onto himself, but then doesn't leave it there. He turns it into God's favor and puts that into you. So now God doesn't look at you at, with his wrath. He looks at you with the same look he looks at his son with. Are you kidding me? That is amazing. I love Jesus. No one has ever seen God, he says. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And that whole perfected understanding he's going to pick back up on in a second. But the example I gave you was one of my children where I raised them with uh, love. Okay, so there's, I've told my children ever since they were wee big. If you want someday, you're going to have a spouse, a husband or a wife. And I want you to look at how me and your mother are. We are 
so in love. Anybody who knows us knows that. We're, they get sick looking at us, okay? So, but my children, some of them have married now, and I get to see in them the love for their spouse that they grew up seeing between me and Bridget. The love that I receive from God, that I express to my children, I see being perfected as they live their life, as they're loving their spouse. So too is it with God. God loves you. He gave his only begotten son for you. And when you realize that and you bestow that love upon somebody, yet while they were sinning against you, if you do such things, God also sees and smiles and says, that's my love being perfected. You're showing uncommon love. You're showing, you're showing unnatural love because the motive is not one for self-gain. The motive is for them. He picks up in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Okay. The evidence that God is in us is in those moments when we choose to honor God over choosing vengeance for ourselves. The spirit in us beckons us to the will of the Father, and when he bends our will to the will of the Father's, and we bestow love onto people that may not deserve it in your opinion, that is the work of the spirit in you. And the very fact that you're doing it testifies that you have the spirit in you. Just the very act of doing it. Now that gets tricky because some people have turned that into like a works-based salvation. That by doing it, you therefore have the spirit. Well, that was nothing new. John was dealing with that then. That's why he flips it and says, no, you do it because you have the spirit. You would not do it if you didn't have the spirit. And now somebody's going to say, well, there's unsaved people that show love towards people all the time. Correct. He's not talking about the natural love of the world. He's talking about the supernatural love that comes in Christian brotherhood. Stuff that goes beyond whatever the world could ever hope to show one another. And it's because it's drawn from and driven by the Spirit to the will of the Father and powered by the blood of His Son. And that is the truth. And because we have that Spirit and we do those things, it's because of that that we do a couple of things that he wants to uh, bring out right now in verses 14 and 15. He says, by the Spirit, you will do verses 14 and 15. He says, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Meaning we have seen it and we proclaim it. When you go out to proclaim Jesus Christ to people, it's difficult if you've ever done street preaching, if you've ever even, uh, I'll just say this, how many times in your life have you sat down at a restaurant and thought this place is really crowded and you felt awkward <coughs> praying over the meal because people would look at you? I'm sure that's happened to everybody here at some point in their life, okay? Um, you get past that. You get beyond that by drawing from the spirit, because it's your flesh that says, no, you'll be embarrassed. Your spirit says, no, you belong to Christ. Show it. So too, when you speak about Christ, you may go to family functions where you're the only believer in the room. And there's 50 people there at some family reunion. I don't want you to say, wow, I'm in like a den of robbers and thieves here. I want you to say, no, whoo, 50 people I get to talk to about Jesus. Till they kick me out. <laughs> so well, that's how we need to turn our minds towards Christ. And we only do so by the power of the Spirit. We can only proclaim what we have seen. Now look at verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Think about that. There's lots of people. Some of them will knock on your door and give you a magazine that tell you they believe in the same Jesus Christ as you do. No, they do not. The Jesus Christ that we proclaim is the only begotten Son of God, period. He shares no authority with anybody else on his throne. No person on heaven, in heaven or on earth can dethrone him or even equal themselves to him. It is Jesus alone that reigns supreme. Yes? 
God is good. Amen. Now, I want to show you, because a lot of people have said, well, John is so lovey-dovey. You know, he's not really, he's not really theological in his writings. I, I just want to cry when I hear that. It's all over the place. So I'm just going to show you one today. All right. If you look back in verse 2 of chapter 4, you're going to see the first part of him saying that in order to belong to Christ, you must affirm Christ's humanity. Look at it. He says, by this you know the Spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now look at verse 15. He says, you must also confess that he is deity. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. In order for you to have a right relationship with God, the, in order for you to trust in the right Jesus, you must proclaim that he was both man and God, two in the one person of Jesus. And if you depart from that, you're speaking of a different Jesus. Okay, So important that we know these things. The love that comes from God through the Spirit comes because of this Jesus. Not because of some other Jesus. Now let's pick back up here. Verse 16, we see that we get this assurance of our own salvation even. And he's gonna, that's going to be a theme until we get to verse 21. That this comes from the Spirit alone. He says, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. You can't even utter those kinds of words without the spirit in you testifying against your flesh. Because as you read those things, the things that start to pop into your fleshly mind are, I'm not good enough. Did he see what I did earlier? Does he know how bad of a sinner I am? If anybody around me knew my sins, they would flog me in the town square. If I, I mean, you, your mind starts to undo what has been eternally granted to you. Eternal life from the Father through the Son. That's already yours. It's not going anywhere. But your flesh can convince you that it's not true. That it wasn't for you. The only, combat, or the only way we can combat that is through word and sacrament. They are the food for the soul that gives us assurance that, in fact, God has not abandoned us. We are not more powerful than God and can peel his hands off of us. Okay? What does Romans say? No, not one of you is good. Not one of you will seek after me. That means he came after you. That's how much you're loved. He came and conquered you. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Look at verse 17. We see this love perfected phrase coming back up. He says, by this is love perfected with us. Meaning by the spirit and us drawing from that and growing in our faith and growing in our showing of love to one another that the love is perfected in us, with us. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. That, I'm a, okay. I watched a sermon five years ago, maybe, on this chapter four and chapter five of John. First of all, I don't know how you can do one sermon on two chapters. I, that's, that's alien to me, as Rob was saying earlier. Uh, it's probably going to take us four years to get through Isaiah. But I, I don't understand how the sermon was... The, covered that many sections of scripture in 27 minutes, but it happened. Um, I slow down and I look at this, and this is such a remarkable verse. And yet in that sermon and three others that I watched, nobody spoke on this verse. Why is that? Well, because if you don't slow down, you'll miss it. Let's look at it again. Verse 17, or excuse me, um, yeah, 17 and 18. By this, meaning by the Spirit, is love perfected with us, by us acting by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Why? So that we may have, what? Confidence. When? In the day of judgment. Why? 
Because as he is, meaning Christ, so also are we in this world. I will never depart from you for the rest of this age, Christ said, as he ascended on high. As you are struggling in this world, so did he. As you're professing God as king over your life, he walks in your midst. Where two or more are gathered, there I am. I call you to worship me every Sunday, Christ says. This is my kingdom that is spreading throughout this world, conquering all. This statement is meant to give you confidence in two things that only the Spirit can make real in your mind. That Christ is with you always. You're not alone. And the day of judgment's coming for everyone. And you'll be okay. You'll be all right. How do I know I'll be all right? Can't you see the love, the uncommon and unnatural love that you're showing people? That's how you know. Now, if somebody comes to me and says, well, I'm just a mean person. I don't love anybody. We might have a problem. We might have a problem. But most of the time in life, every little meanie that I've run into ends up being a little teddy bear. Once you break through, they're like, oh, okay. So get through that with somebody, with God's love, and you might find that you have a good friend or neighbor afterwards. Look at verse 18. Having been empowered now by the Spirit to know that I belong to Christ, I can't undo that, and that on the day of judgment, I'm going to be just fine because I'm found with Christ. Verse 18 picks up and says, There is no fear then in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. If, okay, if you worry, about your own salvation. That does not mean that you're unsaved. In fact, I would say the contrary, because the unsaved don't care. So if you're worried about it, it's because the spirit in you is drawing and pricking upon your own life, saying, hey, there's things you're doing that don't testify of this. Change. And if you don't testify of this, will you still go to heaven? Well, if God saved you, yeah, period. But how effective are you here on earth in the meantime? Zero. If you do not show love for one another, if you don't show compassion and care for one another, then what are we doing? We're just working, right? That's all we do, work. We just work and spend money and, and please ourselves. Love ourselves. But loving others is critically important because it testifies that we belong to Jesus Christ. And he's saying here, if you're afraid, if you look in the mirror and you tremble, don't be afraid. God loves you. The very fact that you're questioning it tells you that, because that's the provoking of the Holy Spirit. God loves you, and he's not going anywhere. Stop fearing. Now, I just want to add one thing. I've heard before that Christians can stand and face a blizzard not afraid, because they stand in the word of God. Well, hear me say this. Get out of the blizzard. <laughs> okay, that blizzard's going to kill you. All right, and then you're going to go meet Jesus, and that's how that will go. We're not unafraid of things to be afraid of. Okay, we're not, but we have eyes and ears. All right, we can see these things. I'll give you an example. My daughter, Lily. No, don't be afraid of her. She's okay. She's got this sallow lizard thing. That she got. You know, the snake, the snake went on to be with Jesus. And so uh, we got this sal salamander lizard thing, right? I can hardly ever find it, which is freaky in and of itself, by the way. But as she was gone with Bridget a couple weeks ago, I had to go buy crickets to feed to this thing. Oh, really? Yeah, I sent my mother. <laughs> Through her, I accomplished this. And so what you do is you take, my daughter showed me this, right? You've got to turn the light on and off at night and all this goofy stuff. Or it'll bake it or something. I don't know. You take off the lid and you just grab these cardboard things full of crickets and you just shake them in there. And they fall around and you put the lid on real careful so the lizard doesn't jump out and eat your face. So those were the instructions I got. Now, I did something that I probably shouldn't have done. I 
waited to see how this lizard would eat these crickets. Because I was like, that lizard's really slow. I mean, this thing's like, like a sloth, right? A little cute sloth. Uh, no. A cricket was like six feet from it. And it just went and nailed it. I didn't even see it. The cricket, there was just legs sticking out of his mouth. And I was like, ah! What, what did I do? I thought, oh my gosh, if this lizard gets out, it's going to do that to my eye. It's going to snatch my eye right out of my face. It can do it. I saw it do this to the cricket, Miss Annabeth. You're looking at me like I'm not being serious. But I was truly concerned. So I looked around. I set something heavy on top of the lid so it couldn't push it up and get out of there, of course. So I wasn't thinking straight. Okay, I was running. It's called the full tilt boogie. All right, I, I wasn't running straight. Now, why do I share that? Because that's a genuine fear for someone like me. All right? Should I stand there and look at the lizard and be like, I am not afraid of thee. I stand in Christ. It's going to eat my eye. And I'll go to heaven with just one eye. That's fine. There's things to be afraid of, and it's okay. So we don't get silly with, you know, these commands. At least I hope not. God's uh, love is perfected in us, again, as we show this love to others. And in fact, the spirit begins to alleviate over time our fears of death. I have, t I have spoken to so many people over the years that were healthy and then weren't. And when I get into those conversations with them, I see something that happens. And it gives me such joy. I see fear go away. I see it go away. And almost to the person do I hear, I can't wait to go see Jesus. Now I'm talking about believers. Unbelievers? I've seen the opposite. And I've seen them claim that they're going to go see God and I knew they weren't. Um, a fear that is at a soul's depth, like where your soul is going, can only be assured of its eternal address by the working of God himself. Look at verse 19. We love because he first loved us. I love how that is just one sentence, period. We love one another because he first loved us when we were extremely unlovable. He chased us down. He conquered us because he loves us. Now look at the last two verses, 20 and 21. You see this Christian love he's speaking of that is not natural. <clears throat> he says, if anyone says, I love God, but now we look at their actions, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Wow. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Wow. I think that that really, when you strip everything away, it, it really does get down to that. If I, can't, if I can't build a trust with people I see, I mean, I know that people are going to sin and they can let me down. But if I can't build a semblance of trust between people I see and love and adoration and compassion and care and joy with the people I see, how can I get that with God who I don't see? I won't is the answer. Now, if I focus on my life through Christ being written in the book of life, before the foundations of the earth were laid, if that is who I am, and I look in the mirror and I know what I've done, and he hasn't gone anywhere, that's the right kind of love to show one another. Birthed from that. Because it's a humble love. It's a love that says, whatever you did, I did it too. And the grace I got from above was overwhelming. It wasn't a little. My cup overflowed. And it still is. That's the love that the person on your left and the person on your right, in front of you and behind you, that's the love that they deserve. 
Will you give it, is the question. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us first, as your scripture so clearly states here. God loved us first. That is astonishing to us. We all know, individually and privately, just how unlovable we are. We all put on masks every day. Masks for our spouses, masks for our neighbors, masks for our workplace, masks for driving in the car. And Father, it's just... It's horrifying if you weren't in our life because we would be standing guilty still today of all of it but Jesus Christ. You sent your son to die on a cross to take all of that and place it upon himself. He took it to the grave. He rose again and left that stuff in the grave. And what did he have? His righteousness. And he then put that into us. He imputed his righteousness to us. We are not worthy. And yet you did. You are good. Continue to shape us into the image of your son. Teach us to love one another. Pull upon us, Father, in those those once in a while moments where we're, we would normally just pop over something. Let us get just 10 more seconds of showing grace. Then a minute next time. Then an hour. Keep growing us in this way because we want to show your love perfected in us. We want to be that light to all the people in this world that offend you and are offended by you. We want to show your love transforming us and the impact it has on them. Why? So that they'll turn and say, I've never seen that. What is driving this love and this grace in you? You had every right to lash back out at me for doing this or thus. And you withheld and instead showed me love. Where does that come from? Oh, Father, that's our opportunity to tell them all about you and your son. That's why you do these things. Continue to grow us in this way. Make us stronger, Father. Make us not be ashamed of you in public. Make us proclaim your name wherever we go. If not in word, then in deed. If not in deed, then in thoughts. In all of these ways, we need improvement every day until you bring us home. And by that improvement, do we show that you're in our life, and as we see the improvement, does it give us assurance that we have everlasting life? Because the God of everlasting is working personally on me. Hallelujah. In the name of, for the sake of Jesus Christ, amen.